appreciate it. We are all pioneering not only a wellness industry, but also a manufacturing one. Um, we appreciate your membership resources as well um, as all of the other services that you provide across the spectrum supporting the hemp industry. So hi everyone, I'm Nicole Burnett, co-owner and director of cultivation for Queen Hemp Company. This is Gail Seifert right here next to me, my business partner and CFO. She controls the chaos up front and honestly today there's quite a lot of chaos going on. So we have uh, trimming going on today. We have uh, planting in the back. We're also flipping out all of our mom stock. So it's a crazy filling orders and, and Gail also has 1099s on her plate. So <laughs> we have a lot going on today. Um, during the presentation, feel free to use the chat function to ask questions along the way. Um, Gail will capture those and we'll address those at the end when we have more of an interactive um, session. So Queen Hemp Company is an indoor hydroponic hemp farm located in Charlotte, North Carolina. We have a diverse advisory board with both medical and legal professionals. We offer consulting, we sell clones, and we also have an award-winning genetics program with uh, two specific varieties that have recently helped us win the local cannabis cup, the Queen City Cannabis Cup, and that those are our electric buffalo and then Stardust CBG. So we are also on Instagram with the handle Queen Hemp Company or Queen Hemp Co. Facebook and YouTube with our new education series called the Hydro Masterclass. Oh, we also just um, entered the Pinterest market. So please go look for us uh, on that platform as well. Um, another thing, uh, YouTube. So we have that education master hydro master class series and that platform is kind of launched to give growing tips and we're getting ready to get into um, all of our flowers so discussions on the types of genetics that we have and what makes them so unique and how we go about developing genetics and choosing those um, those genetics that we want to use um, in our specific grow situation so we also have two nonprofit organizations that are our partners, the Inked Phoenix Project, which offers breast cancer survivors and veterans tattooing to cover their battle scars. Um, and this is also, it's not covered by insurance. So this is a really important um, nonprofit that we kick funds back to, to help support them. We also support Warrior Wellness which is a national veterans organization supporting our warriors, families, and their caregivers who incurred physical or mental injury, illness, or coincident to their military service. So that's another one that we feel really passionate, passionately about. So we have a retail presence as well on our website at queenhempcompany.com. We are also, um, we wholesale into other brick and mortars, including dispensaries, uh, other retailers and pharmacies with a 40 SKU product line, including our tinctures, topicals, pet products, a cosmetic line, gummies, smokable flour, a full re sports recovery line. And our latest addition to the CBD market is our vegan chocolate. And we have those in a number of different flavors. Um, we also currently are just launching one called a, the Love Bar. And so each one of these chocolates has a very unique quality. Our chocolatier is an herbalist. And so they are focused on specific things. For instance, our sea salt um, is used for balancing electrolytes and um, hydration. And so obviously the Love Bar is full of aphrodisiacs like uh, Damian leaf and chocolate itself is an aphrodisiac. So currently we sell into almost uh, every state across the country and also into Canada. And it's, it's really exciting. I'm almost, I, I'm floored every day just, just talking about this from an aerial view. We have grown so very fast and um, we have a small close knit crew and we all wear multiple hats. And I think that's one of the, the points I wanted to really get across. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this when you're launching a business and the industry is so young that we're all wearing multiple hats and trying to plug into those different areas and round out a business and then just, you know, keep it going through the tough times and then also grow. 
Um, I would like to, I would consider us uh, a fairly small craft farm and um, I'm really proud of our team and how much we've accomplished um, in such a very short time. Um, we are also currently looking for a bigger space. Um, that's an exciting thing for us. Uh, we're in about 10,000 square feet right now and I think we're looking to um, double or triple our, our grow space. So a little bit of specs about, about the facility. We are in, like I said, a 10,000 square foot standalone leased commercial building. Um, our zoning is I-2. However, I do know for our application, hydroponic application, I-1 would work uh, just fine. We have our offices and our stock room and order fulfillment up front and our growing areas and clone room and mom room in the back. So we do have a separate bedroom and clone room. Those are all in, in different parts of the facility. And we have a flex space um, that we use for clone storage or for breeding. Um, we often will vet new genetics um, and even nutrients or new likes that we're interested in running. Um, so that's one of those things that, that it's really good to have that kind of space. When you're considering um, your grow and expansion, you really wanna vet out those before you dive in. Um, we outsource locally uh, for our extraction and bottling and manufacturing. And I wanted to do a little shout out to Brad Todd and Sean Hatley from Growers Hemp for your expertise and guidance in the parts of the process that are not really in our capacity currently. Um, so this slide shows you a little bit about what the process was like for us from start to finish. We use three different kinds of hydroponic growing mediums depending on the application. So for example, we use rock wool blocks in our flowering room. We use pro mix and that you can see on the bottom lower left quadrant, um, our mom room uh, is pro mix, which is a peat and perlite mix, which actually looks like soil, but um, is not, is still considered a hydroponic medium. And we also use peat plugs for our clone business. Um, our outfit was about a three month process. As you can see up at the, uh, the left hand top side, it was uh, removed into a, it was like an architectural print building and the power racking was on site, but we not in the configuration that we needed it in. So we spent a lot of time really planning out and detailing how we were gonna go about this. Um, so we only had to move that racking once. Um, Basically, we just had to learn the space. We had to learn the functionality of it. Um, and this is gonna be true when we move into another space. So each space has their a little bit different flow and um, ways that you can configure it and even how your AC works and then your electrical, um, your power to different spaces. So uh, we still stage upgrades of the irrigation system and other operations and our quest for better efficiency. So no matter how much planning you do ahead of getting your um, facility set up, you should always focus on the down the road, you know, keep looking toward the future for different ways to increase your efficiencies. And there are new products coming out all the time, especially in the nutrient world that might um, work better than what you have and, and help shave some of the costs down for your overall grow. So right now I wanna show you a video. Um, so sit back and relax for a moment and um, we're gonna to tour the farm. So that's literally what we're doing today is dropping brand new blocks in. And those are that, the rock wool blocks that I spoke of um, and uh, getting, getting the back prepared for another grow. So uh, we have 1,450 grow sites and we turn approximately five crops a year. We grow on power racking and uh, use full spectrum LED. Although you can see it looks a little bit of a, like a purple hue to it. Um, here's an interesting side note that we small scale trial new irrigation and planting configurations all the time. So 
um, in some of the sections that we use these four by eight trays, we might have 24 blocks and then other ones we're running um, 32 blocks just to test out our different configurations and see if we can get more density and more production out of the space that we are, we're limited to by the size of those, those trays. So we're always honing operations and always trying to figure out our efficiencies for the space. And this is also true for the front of the house operations too. So we do have an online retail presence and trying to use the space um, in a multi-purpose kind of way because it's also our marketing space. Um, <laughs> but also just procedures for fulfilling orders, for getting our manufacturing, what like what we need, our supply. Um, uh, so it is smooth. And that's, that's one of those big challenges of a business. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I cut my teeth on field growing for food production. And I also have experience with greenhouse grows and I've been a hemp grower for about 20 years. So I'm also an avid, avid grower of everything else. Uh, I've taken the Master Gardener class in Union County, as well as the Master Beekeepers class and many controlled environment agriculture classes. Um, I owned and ran a, a small 14,000 site commercial high, leafy greens, microgreens, specialty lettuces business for six years prior to starting Queen Hemp Company. So I spent a lot of those years in local farmers markets and selling into high-end restaurants and really learning how important it is to know your farmer and know where your food comes from. And then now this is also true in this application where you need to know your wellness and where your wellness comes from. And that's one of those things where I think that I'm particularly, that I really do enjoy about the indoor application um, because you can control all those variables. And when you do that, you're optimizing that plant's potential. Um, the most valuable experience though of all for me has been teaching entomology. So that's the study of bugs and that, the, that process of really learning the ins and outs of um, the good bugs and the bad bugs has really been helpful. And I tap into that knowledge every day on the farm. So in the indoor game, knowing your enemy is everything. And that's something that um, has served us well. Um, and because as you know, Growing indoor is, it's not easier than, than outdoor. As a matter of fact, it's a lot harder. And one of those vulnerabilities is pest management because you don't have those natural predators the way that you would um, if you were a true outdoor grower. Um, so like I said, I'm here to tell you that indoor growing is way more difficult, but, and it's also more expensive. However, um, your product really by leaps and bounds um, is potentially better. So another interesting factor in the hemp growing world is that it does matter what variety you grow and under what conditions. And what I mean by that is most outdoor varieties are fine for indoor application, but not necessarily the other way around. For example, um, Bayox, which is a 50-50, uh, indica sativa hybrid, which is a great performer for both indoor and outdoor applications. And we've had success with that. And I know a lot of our outdoor friend, friends um, and farmers uh, also have excellent production from that particular variety. ACDC, on the other hand, is geared more for indoor and greenhouse production rather than outdoor. Um, so that's something that people need to just really make sure and vet your genetics provider. And uh, for those solid performers, for your growing environment, a lot of people um, don't realize how important it is to uh, talk with your clone provider and tell them exactly how you're growing so that they get a, real, a good understanding of um, what kind of varieties you're looking for and even what kind of lights you're using. All of those make a difference. All those variables make a huge difference. So for an indoor grow operation, the lights also matter. Um, what you use to veg under, what lights you're using for um, your flowering. We have two different types of lights that we use. Um, we use HPS lights for our mom room. And then, like I said, the full spectrum LED. And currently we're actually trialing out um, 
our uh, some ceramic, some CMHs, ceramic metal halide lights for our flowering for this run. So any, every light combination, every um, varietal that you're using and even your feeding schedules are all different variables that can affect your grow. And one other key thing to remember um, that those environmental factors like light intensity and your heat, those are also some things that can potentially be stressors for plants and cause the THC to pop. So that's another one of those things that people don't think about um, when they're considering the variables and what they need to bring in to kind of control some of those factors. So um, this slide points to the fact that hemp has been around for an extremely long time. In fact, it, date, it dates back to 8,000 BCE. Hemp has been used for centuries in many different cultures around the world as food, as medicine and clothing and materials. Um, I love this particular historical fact that in 1938, the, the magazine Popular Mechanics detailed 25,000 different uses for industrial hemp. So it's one of the ancient crops that today is being recognized again for its diversity and use of newly uh, new wellness applications. Although that being said, um, I just saw a clip of um, a company out of Seaverville and they're using hemp fiber to make flooring. So that's, that's really exciting. So across industry, hemp is really um, relevant again, and that's super exciting. So another thing, this is a slide that uh, talks a little bit about our integrated pest management or IPM. And for me, this is the key to success for growing. So even though we are a true indoor, um, I wanted you to see how nature has a prerogative. So all of these are pictures, actual pictures of critters that we found in our flower room, which I'm not quite sure how they got in there, but I didn't bring them in there, but there they are. And, and then I also have a staff person who thinks it's really silly to uh, put pre-rolls in their mouths. So you just have to have a little bit of humor wherever you can get it. I mean, this can be a really stressful industry with a lot of moving parts. And so we try to find a little bit of humor wherever we can. So one of the major vulnerabilities for the indoor grow is that there literally are just no predators, no natural predators inside. Um, these guys, these little guys you see here help us out from time to time. But um, that being said, when there is a problem, uh, if you're not prepared for that problem, it's likely to be a very big one. So have an established integrated pest management protocol in place to look and manage those issues before they get out of control. So some of the things that we use um, for our IPM, we use a high powered lube and also a microscope to look for issues. We set up a, um, a protocol where we do random checks, leaf checks, paying particular attention to the undersides of the leaves and also along the stem. We set up a reg regular schedule for checks and maintenance applications just to make sure we're maintaining good um, health uh, below the surface as well as above the surface. Um, there is actually an FDA approved list of applications with some biologicals and then um, a very limited pesticide option, which um, I can have this document available as a resource list um, for those that are interested in it. But be aware that there are restrictions to what you can use depending on the stage of development of the plant. Some of these applications are um, only for the vegetative stage and not for flowering. And, but the biologicals can be used um, both during vegetative and during flowering. So we use predator mites and you can see in the upper left-hand quadrant is um, our persimilis, which we use um, to combat the two spider, spider mites if we ever have issues with those. We use a lot of nematodes, which are unsegmented roundworms to do battle below the surface. Um, they're great for killing fungus gnat larvae. We also use an entomopathogenic fungi, which is an application um, that is for aphids. So it's actually a fungus that's in liquid form that you put on um, your plants. You just do a, a root drench or even a foliar drench and it attacks soft bodied stages of development. So 
um, well, the specific name of it is Baruvia bassinia. Like for instance, any of those larval stages or nymph stages are susceptible and, and can be put at bay um, by using this kind of a fungal treatment. So again, just a, as a, a note to be very careful about what you use, especially if you are extracting for tinctures or for other ingestibles or growing for smokable flour that, you know, this is a wellness product. And, um, you know, the idea is that we're having as clean of a product as possible. And with indoor growing, that certainly, you certainly can achieve it. It's just a matter of really looking at what your ingredients are and following those established protocols for applications. Um, another tip that I have that we've just run into before um, is that some of these products that you think um, are just totally natural and can be used uh, across the grow might in fact contain some inert ingredients that could potentially pop on a pesticide report. For example, um, sulfur is one of those ones that, um, and it depends on the brand, but sometimes there could be an inert ingredient that would, it, it actually looks like it's um, a synergist, so, or a surfactant. It's one of those things that helps bond that particular material or the compound to the plant. Um, and we ran into this before and we couldn't figure out why this was happening. And in fact, it was that inert ingredient and I had to call the company and talk to the chemist and ask about what those inerts are. So if you're looking for a 100% clean pesticide report, it would, be, it would be in your best interest to really vet all those inert ingredients in addition to whatever is listed on, on, that, um, on their list. So um, this is a picture of after harvest, how we dry. Drying and curing is one of those really important parts of the process. Um, we do that on site. We literally hang up trellising in between the rows. And um, to me, this is another one of those difference makers in um, the quality of your final product because, um, and it will affect the price you can get too. So you can have beautiful outdoor grown or even indoor grown product, but then if you, if you also don't have good practice in place for your, your drying, that really will affect your bottom line. And as you know, so indoor growing is so much more expensive that it's really important to maximize the price you're getting, the dollar amount that you're getting for the pounds. Um, so reset uh, is what we do when we clean everything out, we harvest, we get rid of the blocks, we have to scrub everything down, including the walls and the floors. Um, it's probably one of the more stressful times um, in our rotation of what we do on the farm. And it's very labor intensive. Uh, to keep our timeline of rotation, we um, have to reset, uh, sterilize, cleaning, replanting, all within about a three to five day window. So this also means that we're having to pull clones on that schedule so that they're then ready to plant and go in. Um, meanwhile, there's that job of trimming and weighing and packaging to sell the, the crop at hand. So it's just a lot of moving parts that we um, are constantly trying to tweak our efficiencies and um, get our crews together to help us uh, manage all that. So this picture um, kind of shows a, you know, from harvest, there's Gail and myself sitting there after one of our first harvests and, um, and then what it looks like green. So at the top, you can see our different varieties that we have and the material that's just been cut. And then at the bottom, you see our stardust that's been jarred up um, for sale. So um, that's one of those important things. Having your distribution channel set up ahead of harvest is key. So, I mean, keep in mind that getting that top dollar of flour also means that you have to have all the bells and whistles. So it has to look top shelf and it has to be 100% clean because most buyers expect all those current labs, pesticides, mycos, um, residuals, all of those um, tests run, as well as a cannabinoid, cannabinoid report, and then also a, um, a potency uh, lab also done. So thankfully, we built up a really good group of willing trimmers. That's, um, that's a special art, people that are really enjoy trimming and um, can do it well. Uh, so if you've ever had to do this, you know 
that's a labor intensive process. Trying to teach someone how to do it if, if they're not you know, used to doing it can be a little bit tricky and you can really lose a lot of your bottom line um, with people that are inexperienced that don't know what they're doing. So you kind of want the quality job of a bonsai art artist on a, on a dime budget, <laughs> if that's even possible. <laughs> so here's a, here's a little video. We have super fast trimmers and um, they are, yeah, it's, it's a long process. Our trimming takes roughly a couple weeks. So, and it's, you know, you also have to clean your, clean your scissors and have all your gloves and everything ready to go. Which was a challenge during COVID. Oh, it's been a major challenge during COVID. <laughs> we couldn't get alcohol, so we had to use, uh, bring in vodka Basically, to clean everything. Like 90 proof vodka, just to uh, <laughs> bridge the gap between the isopropyl uh, supply and demand issues. <laughs> So capital investment, that's what this slide is all about. Um, that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, you would think that distribution channels uh, should be the very last thing that you need to worry about. And initially when I created this slide, that was, at the, that was at the far right or the back end. And then I looked at that, you know, and I said, honestly, that's the first thing you need to consider. Um, it is the very first priority. This is true for whatever your form or your end goal is, like if it's product or biomass, smokable flour, you need to have detailed who is buying it. So I know this slide is especially dense. So we could, you want to have some fun again and do a little, um, little challenge. Uh, and so let's see if you would like to use the chat function and guess our monthly electric bill. That would be great. The closest guess we're going to have you guys win one of our love bars. <laughs> yeah, one of our 100 milligram love bars. So make sure you put your first and last name um, to your guess. And that will be your, what you're guessing is our electric bill um, on a monthly basis. So also keep in mind that the market for product, especially the smokable flower market, is a little volatile. It's a, it's, a, it's a commodity. So there are certain times of the year where the market is flooded and that um, the pro there's a lot of product out there and you can expect to see a dip in, in the pricing. Um, that's why it's really important to kind of look ahead and get that aerial view so you know like what, what is out there currently. If the market is saturated with Bayox or with whatever, um, Hawaiian, for instance, you want to make sure that you are growing something, uh, planning ahead so that you have availability um, that no one else is going to have. So this, this diagram is also just about business planning. So making an actual business plan. So budget, revisit that plan. We are, are always tweaking. We even did a, uh, like a mind map, like a bubble map of, of really the different areas that we could branch out into. And then um, Gail is just so amazing at running um, our cost analysis and that so it keeps us on track. So we're not going down um, a rabbit hole when it's in the end gonna cost us more than um, going down another path. So um, some of these points may not be unexpected, but um, maybe underestimated. So underestimated costs for example, for us that we just really didn't realize it was going to be so much were insurance, uh, marketing and packaging, security, um, e-commerce fees, and um, also liability. Um, Blake, I know you um, and the Southeast Hemp Association has a lot of those resource members and it's just great. So reach out, use, use uh, the platform to connect with people in the industry that can really help um, help out with getting you your planning and your long view to, to happen. So here's a little detail. I'm, I'm not gonna give you our whole business plan, but this is just a, a little detail that we, we truly went over and it took us a while to really tweak this properly. Um, this is just one single aspect of what we put together for our performa, our one year, three year, five year out. So this is our detail of our flower room and our slurry room, and um, which we're obviously gonna have to redo when we move to a new space. And uh, one of the interesting things is to, that we just 
we had to be prepared to make modifications along the way and allow for a 10 to 20 percent overage not just on cost of upfit but also the timeline of your upfit um, so, you know, because of budget restrictions uh, for us, we only upfit half of the back room to start with. And then six months later, we added in a fertigation system. So we now actually have a dosatron um, that helps facilitate that because before we were literally hand watering with a 55 gallon on a hand cart that we drug around the back. So, you know, just little things that, <laughs> you know, it's just, you gotta do what you gotta do to get it done. But the, the, the upgrades, the, where you put your money, those capital allocations is really important. So a year after that, we added the hive. That's what we call our slush room. And you can see it up there at the top. And that's the room where we, it's our slush space. We do um, breeding trials. Um, and we also house clones if we have an especially big order and also run trials for lights as well. So I have, here is my best advice. I have, a, I've, I collected a little list of things, the best that I can give for what the experiences that we have. And I keep hammering distribution channels. It's the first thing that you should do. And I'm seriously not kidding. That is so important. Do not think that an LOI um, is a binding contract or set in stone. Um, too many farmers are still sitting on biomass from last year with nowhere for it to go that has a limited shelf life. And expect a 15 to 20% overage in upfit costs. Um, also your marketing, your labels, your liability, trimmers all cost money and affect your bottom line. And just be prepared for the long haul. Um, there will be grows where things happen. Um, and sometimes we have had to actually just, it, it wouldn't be the ideal, but um, it's looking at that economic threshold of whether or not to continue with a grow. Is it gonna make sense? Are you gonna break even? Or different ways to supplement that, you know, that profit margin line so that you're not gonna, you're not, it's not gonna hurt you too much. So give yourself time to test grow all of your genetics before you commit to a full grow. That's one thing that I think has really served us well because not all of, the, all of those genetics um, perform the way you would think indoors versus outdoors and, and yields especially. Um, remember um, that all of these genetics respond differently to different variables. Uh, that's why you'll see differences across the market. I have people ask us all the time, why does your, you know, your ACDC looks just so deep dark purple, but I've also seen green ACDC. And that really is a factor of several things. The lighting is one of them. And then also the nutrient uh, application. So all of those are important. You know, all those considerations that you, you make, um, keeping in mind your distribution end. Um, so another thing, absolutely have, a, have backup equipment and have replacement parts on hand. So expect that whatever it is, it's going to fail on a Friday today, <laughs> Friday holiday weekend, for example. Yeah, let me tell you a little short story about a motherboard. And this is a motherboard to our water pump for our 550 gallon um, cistern that we have. And it was, we had a bad storm and it blew out one of the three phases um, for the electrical and it just fried the motherboard. So we ended up at the last minute and it took days because it was over a weekend to get the replacement motherboard in. So we literally were hand watering 1500 plants um, in the back and you know, just things can happen. And then we also had a power outage where we had thousands of clones without their 18 hours of light on. So really having um, something in place just in case of catastrophe because uh, always expect that at some point that will happen. <laughs> um, and then I also, we keep de detailed journals and notes on um, the effects that we see from all of these trials that we do. So for example, um, a change in lighting or nutrients or a water supply change or even growing mediums. We've literally gone through three different types of the rock wool blocks to find the one that we like that works the best under our conditions because they're not all created equally. So it's, it's one of those um, 
you just have to give yourself time to test all those variables um, without costing yourself the bottom line. So I would say, you know, again, doing a small scale trial is one of those essential practices that we use a lot around here. And then also just not underestimating the vulnerability of a grow um, for pests. Make sure you set up a solid um, IPM plan and follow it down to the last detail um, and have your supplies on hand. Sometimes it's just walking the line and going through every plants or doing that random check under a microscope is tedious. And, and sometimes it's just, you feel like it's easy to skip. Oh, I don't say anything, but those are the times where you just have to follow through on that, on that protocol because um, like I said, and the conditions that are ideal for growing are also ideal for um, pests and their reproductive cycles. So that's one of those things that can get out of hand so, so quickly. And lastly, um, just being dynamic and flexible, having that flexibility to pivot in the market if the market demands it. So there are certain times a year where, you know, product innovation is more important. And then other times a year when maybe um, there isn't as much flour available, smokable flour, just really looking at that, making note of that and keeping calendars and detailed records so that you're prepared. Um, and then take, take, taking the time, having someone who is really diligent about your cost analysis and runs through all of those things so that you know exactly where your, your money is going. Um, Okay, so thank you so very much uh, for the opportunity to share the Queen Hemp story. Thanks again to Blake Butler um, and the Southeast Hemp Association. Your support and ne network opportunities are so appreciated. So oh. feel free to contact us also at queenhempcompany at gmail.com or my um, other email is Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, at queenhempcompany.com. Also check out our Hydra Masterclass series on our website for indoor um, hydroponic growing tips. And at this point, I would like to open up the discussion to kind of answer some of those questions that you have. Oh, and last call for guessing our electric bill via chat to win the love bar. <laughs> and the chat function, everybody, is right down there at the bottom. So if you want to, you know, engage Nicole or Gail in a question and, you know, Harvey, I know as an outdoor grower, you're thinking about going indoors. And I saw Megan just joined us, a new member from Tennessee. Um, and there's a couple of the people on phone that I think are going to come in via chat. But anything that you want to ask them, please do. Um, we're recording this. So we'll put this back out, out there if you missed any, um, you know, part of this presentation. All right. So I'm also going to show you. So we're they're trimming over there, and so I'm going to hold up a couple of our electric buffalo nuggets that are hand trimmed. And currently, this electric buffalo, what is it, fifteen fifteen hundred 1500 a pound is what what it's going for right now. Nice. That's another thing too. We're trying to figure out what those pricing, the pricing structure. Um, it mostly stays the same, but like I said, it being a commodity, I mean, it, it can shift. It shifts over time. I'm um, also going to quickly flip the camera around so you can see our uh, trimmers back there. Say hi. Hey, guys. Wave. Wave. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harvey, I just unmuted you if you have a question uh, for Queen Hemp, if you do. Can you hear me? Uh, I've been I've been an out outside grower and I've been talking to these two ladies, uh, Karen and Jay, and about uh, maybe growing in a greenhouse. So Karen probably has more questions than I would about a greenhouse. Oh yeah. All right. Let me get to Karen here. So generally, I'll just right off the top, I'll just tell you that the breakdown for the flower market, the smokable flower market, is generally outdoor is the lowest and or commands the lowest dollar per pound, then the, that intermediate level is greenhouse. The indoor seems to be the one that the environment that commands the highest dollar. I mean, and again, those are just because of a factor of several things. So outdoor, it's, it's cost. Um, it's also um, your 
pollution, any drift from someone else outdoor, you're just vulnerable that way because hemp is a good bioremediator and pulls up toxins out of the ground. Um, greenhouse, you can kind of control that a little bit more depending on what uh, medium you're using. You seem to be, ha in, at least in greenhouse, a lot of people bring in beneficials. Um, some people, and the difference maker in a greenhouse situation is if you have that light depth set up or a supplemental lighting. So there are those people that have greenhouses without that. Um, and you can tell the difference in the flower. So the, I mean, the more you put into it, the more you're gonna get out of it. You have a question for Karen? Um, no, to be frank right now, um, we're, uh, we're not really, um, uh, our focus right now is to get into retail stores. Um, right. Currently, um, Jay is selling, she has a massage business. Um, so that's where a majority of our products are being sold. Um, so that's our main focus right now. Um, our our long-term focus would, you know, our long-term plan is to, is to grow our own flower so that we can control everything. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I mean, that's what we did as well. I yeah. mean, you just gotta figure out what, what's in your wheelhouse. I mean, yes. Traction was not in ours. <laughs> we thought it was. We thought it was. <laughs> okay. yeah. All righty. So I'm gonna introduce uh, and Megan. I want you to introduce yourself because you're you're new to the group. And uh, so just to let you guys know um, that uh, Megan and her husband um, just joined us as our first members from Tennessee. Oh, excellent. Awesome. Wow, uh, congrats. Let's see where she is here. Hey. hey guys, sorry, I'm in the car and it's kind of breaking up. My name's Megan. We own uh, the Harvest Club Farm Direct. We are a, a, a uh, what are we? <laughs> we are a software platform that is utilizing blockchain technology right now that will be able to, uh, you know, farmers will be able to document those good agricultural practices and good growing practices uh, and just validate your story uh, of what you're already doing. Uh, legitimize cannabis and, and set standards. Yeah. And, and we're so excited, guys, that Megan and Matthew, her husband, have come in not only from being from Tennessee, but you know, we talk about this and many of you met Sean at C Tracks about what is this blockchain chain of custody so every product is safe for consumption whether it's taken under the tongue or smoked and you know we all want Absolutely. that system in place and that's when Megan and I got on the phone and she started talking I was like my gosh I mean if we can get some help in this area it would just allow us to one day put that stamp on our products and say we stand behind this because we know it's safe from yeah, seed that's so important that traceability and transparency that really is so I would I'm really excited to hear more about that for sure mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to do a Zoom interview with Megan well, and Matthew. Awesome. I'd be happy to share some. No, go ahead, Megan. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, you go. You go. Oh, well, I was just saying I'd be happy to, to, to share, you know, all kinds of information, um, you know, without being annoying. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, I love to talk about it. But <laughs> well, what we'll do, what, what uh, we'll we really do, Megan. In consumer safety and what we'll do, Megan, is I'll do a Zoom interview with you and Matthew to kind of introduce your company to everybody. And we'll put it out there and they can understand a little bit more what you do. And I'd really think we should do something, maybe a little interactive question and answer with you guys too, as people want to understand how blockchain technology works. How would that work in to not be that traditional C COA we think of, but just a whole nother system in itself. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's just so much manipulation to COAs and, and other practices and, uh, yeah. Just putting that stamp on, like you said, and, and creating standards is important. And transparency is absolutely increasing in demand. So well, we're excited you. to share. Well, and I'll be down there, you know, the 16th or 17th. So maybe we can set something up. Yeah, there. that's right. That's right. We can do it in person. They're coming to Asheville, <laughs> Tennessee and visit some of our girls. So thank you, Megan. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, guys. All right, let me see if I can. Uh, let me see. So there was one question from last last yes. session that I think I want to bring up because it was such a good question. Um, it was asking about our genetics and the, the electric buffalo. Where did that come from? How did we go about choosing that? Um, 
it was one of those things where uh, because of the way we grow, because of the limited head height that we have for growing and then our space itself and the way we provide nutrients, we're looking for several things. So basically it's structure and it's growth habit. I mean, obviously it's yield, that's, that's very important. Um, and then we are looking for some distinct cannabinoid profiles that we're going after. So it literally was a year long process of going, getting the, a really good male phenotype, a good female phenotype of the two different ones that we really liked, um, all of the aspects of, and then breeding them. And from there you end up with hundreds and hundreds of seeds that then you have to vet for male, female, and then those different phenotypes of the females and then flower them out to see if those are the ones, which ones you like, because there's such a wide variety of the phenotype, the genotype, um, what it's, you know, what it's chromosomal makeup is and it's cannabinoid makeup is versus what it is physical appearance. And so just trying to find that right one. And I think we really lucked out with the electric Buffalo because it was, probably 25 different phenos that we really went through um, and vetted out. Uh, but it is, it's a long process. And also the market. So if you have like a, a process that takes a year, but then the market is Change. changes. I mean, it's just really hard to uh, keep up with everything. It's such a, it's a good thing because the industry is just so dynamic, but planning for that, planning for the security of that is often really hard to do. Nicole, one of our guys that was on the phone that had to leave just texted me and wants to know how important you guys think it is to be a USDA organic grower, to be GAP certified. I mean, you know, all our growers are starting to wonder, like, how important is that to start moving in that direction? So I honestly, now, I would be interested to hear some guidance from some other industries that are connected with this one. But in my experience... Um, what they really want to see is that you're 100% clean on your pesticide report and those things. I don't know that it particularly matters if you're USDA certified um, organic. And again, that's, that's one of those, it's a long process. You, it's a lot of record keeping. And then also it, um, it's expensive. It really is. I mean, I'm sure there is a, a category and it's a bonus to be able to say that. But for us right now, it's not outweighing the cost of doing it versus the return you get from it. Mm -hmm. As long, and I'm, I'm gonna caveat, the caveat to that though, is as long as you can say that you have 100% clean product, right? Yeah. Pesticide free, you know. If you've ever been on a farm that is growing organically, you, you would actually question, is that cleaner? <laughs> <laughs> Often that's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just haven't seen the, the numbers of what you get out of that. Um, line up with what you need to put into it. Anybody else have a question for Nicole via chat or anything else? So uh, you see the, uh, do you see Gail, the chat, the, the guests is there on the electric bill. I mean, Harvey, my God, if that was their electric bill, Harvey, they'd be rolling, huh? <laughs> that is our electric bill. I know, I know what it is. That's what I was like making yeah. fun of it. I knew the answer. Yeah, he's right. About what was it? What's it exactly? 3523. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Congratulations. <laughs> then Harvey, two chocolate bars for that one. Man, right. came close. Yeah. yeah. I thought for a second, did he see my email or text to you guys or whatever? I said, like, hey, I know the answer. And then I realized it didn't reveal the figure, but Harvey, nice guess there. Yeah, right on. Right on so, the money. So everybody, uh, Nicole is gonna be nice enough to, you know gather up some of these materials and send them to everybody as well as we're going to represent this to our members. I can tell you that we've got all sorts of text messages and emails. People are going a little nuts right now in our industry because the commission is talking about Delta 8. Oh, wow. I, think, I think that took about 10 people away from our uh, growers college, but just to let you guys know, just to fill you in and what I'm getting um, uh, pretty much uh John Lanier, the lawyer for the Department of Ag, is going to listen to the DA believing that Delta 8 is illegal. It is a synthetic. Sheriff Manning, the commission uh, board member, asked straight up, are Delta 8 uh, gummies and other candies illegal in our state? And John said the DEA thinks so, and we're going to follow their lead. So 
you know, knowing that some of our members do have Delta eight products in their stores, that's a shot across the bow. So those products probably need to be put into the back room for a little while till this whole thing is figured out. But once the conversation starts, much like we know our friends uh, that are on the call from North Carolina, how the smokable hemp started, an SBI memo, and all of a sudden we were fighting for our lives. So not that nobody's going to die and live and die on the Delta 8 hill because it's a little bit trickier as it relates to our industry, but just knowing that some of our folks are involved in some of the products, we have to be very proactive because the Hemp Commission of North Carolina is talking about it right now. The lawyer for the Department of Ag is talking about it right now. So that tells us that the conversation is, of, is occurring at, at different levels. Yeah. So give everybody a heads up. That's kind of, right as this whole thing started, they started off talking about Delta 8. So it was an exciting afternoon here in North Carolina. Hemp wow. stuff. What, what, do, what is it? What, is, what are they saying? Are they going to make people stop selling it or immediately? Well, what can you no. do about it? product already on the market. That's what I'm wondering. Well, that's just it. If I ever got an opportunity to sit with them and say, wouldn't this be a great time to, to standardize this and regulate this and figure out, because we know some people are, you know, they're getting help from Delta 8. And I think what, what has happened and, you know, it just, it happens with everything else. It's being abused in some capacities. Some edibles are being made, 100 milligrams, 150 milligrams of vape carts, very high um, individuals aren't being educated what Delta 8 really does to them. And for any of those that have experienced it, it does make give you a different euphoric feeling than well, just our smokable flower strains in certain capacities. But again, without regulation, without standardization, who knows what's in them? And so, as we know, if it hurts anybody in our state, and they'll take it off the shelves the next weekend without asking any questions. Yeah. Are they supposed to be giving a ruling on that today or are they just like starting the conversation? Well, I think they're starting the conversation. I listened in to a law enforcement call last week trying to understand were they talking about it. Um, you know, I've had multiple calls of the concern about THC being in the package on the packaging. I mean, guys, if you think about it, if we, I mean, the, 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 the silliest thing we've done with Delta 8, if you want to protect us, putting THC on all the packaging because law enforcement. I'm really shocked by, to see yeah, that. They I'm walk, they walk by the store and they say, well, how can they put THC on it if there's not THC in it? Oh, it's a synthetic THC. It's okay. It's not illegal. That's the worst thing to say to any sheriff. Like, what? So to make a long story short, enough of those have got back down to Raleigh. That's got back to the, back to the commission. What does that relate to in, in hemp? You know, it, it's a very kind of far-fetched way to be related to him. But at the same time, I think that we do know it's helping people. We do know it has that natural relief. So I don't know whether we can remove the bad actors quick enough, you know, to protect it. So what we can do proactively, as you know, is reach out to our members and say, hey, we sent some unrest. And the way they do it in North Carolina is they just come and take it off the shelves. Yeah. So oh, wow. just know that we might have to put it in the back room. And I think that's some of the value of being part of a, you know, association is, is being able to, um, you know, um, share information <laughs> like that. And we know it. You got something to add, Megan? No, no, no. Oh, is, yeah. Is this North Carolina only, Blake? That's North Carolina only right now. Okay. You know, it's just that we've honestly, Megan, we've, you know, we have such a strong smokable flower market. It's about 70% of our hemp market right now. And the Delta 8 flower jumped onto the scene so fast and people right. advertise it as THC infused flower. Law enforcement immediately felt like, what are these hemp guys up to now? Oh, no. Yeah, I know. You know. So look at them trying to get around the law. And, and it, but again, we will own it in that we'll have to really see how it all shakes out. But it's it's a tricky one, Megan. It really is in the way it's developed and the way it's shown up in, in different places. We've lost control of it really fast. And I know some members are making a lot of money off of it, but there's really nothing I can do about it at this point other than be very proactive. Right. Wow. Yeah. Because you remember. That's when unfortunate. The, yeah. When you remember when the DEA IFR came out and we were all looking through it six months ago, it talked about crude and it talked about Delta 8. And they're not going to do anything with crude. There's barely any processors in business right now to raid. So they're going to go after Delta 8, honestly, because they're bored and without funding with recreational marijuana, making more of an impact. They can't fly their helicopters over fields anymore. 
they're going to get involved with what they call the synthetic THC areas. And that starts with Delta eight, Delta 10. I've had our growers tell me about all sorts of deltas. I'm like, just shut it. Okay. My <laughs> understanding <laughs> my under, my understanding was that if it was synthesized from from CBD, then that was considered illegal. But as long as it came from the plant, which is just you know minute amounts, then that was legal. Yeah, I think I think the processing is what gets us into the the gray areas. How people pour acid on it to get the D eight out of it. It just becomes this messy thing, Megan. That sure. We're, trying to understand and but but again I, I go back to if it hurts somebody we're never going to have an opportunity to bring out how it could help people Absolutely. and so that's why I hate how we get the bad actors into a you know get involved so fast that it gets a little out of control and ends up on every corner so our transparency is so important absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Any other questions? And I'll get off Delta, but I did want to share that with you because you'll probably hear that from another member. No. Oh, hold on. Did I mute you? Nicole, I muted you, I think, did I? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Right, uh, Gail sending a chat to Harvey to please send along his address so we can, and contact info so we can get that love bar out to him. Yeah. And, and Karen, we appreciate you joining. Megan, uh, Patrick had to sign off, and Jill did too, but we appreciate everybody joining. Like I said, I've got it recorded. Awesome. So, and then we'll go back and look at it, Nicole, and be sure everything looks good. Sounds but good. More, but more important, keep on doing this so they'll grow, and we really appreciate you guys' time in the middle of this busy day. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye. everybody, for joining us. Have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs>